can I just say, Minister Heapy, you will be missed. I'm sorry you are stepping down. Yeah. And just to say, from a personal level, I thank you for the private briefings to ensure that the House was informed. So you will be missed, and thank you for that service. We now come to number one, Jessica Morton. Number one, Mr. Speaker. She has pursued this, and I've enjoyed our meeting to discuss the matter and meetings with the Welsh Guards. It, it is important that this is handled quickly, and we are moving at pace to ensure that we uh, can do so, uh, with, of course, the caveats that I have just described. Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, Mr Speaker, I knew a number of the people that served in the Welsh Guards at the time, having been in the Scots Guards myself. And a number who didn't come back. And can I say congratulations to the Honourable Lady for her question? But the key point here is my right honourable friend says they're moving at pace, but this is decades after this has happened, and there is no question now that there was some kind of a cover up that took place. So when he comes to look at those documents again, can he please make sure that on the balance of judgment that we err in favour of opening up so that those who have, been, have died and have had their reputations trashed can actually stand up once again and say proudly it wasn't them. Minister. Well, the Board of Inquiry is quite clear about the attribution of blame, and, and the Welsh Guards were absolutely exonerated, and that's the Government's position. My position is always uh, for one of transparency, and certainly when I've been looking at these documents, that's been at the forefront of my mind. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I too was at the event that uh, my honourable friend from Newport East attended at the weekend, and there, on behalf of my constituent Colin Silver, who was there, um, and many of the others who, of course, didn't come back uh, from the brave Welsh Guards. Um, I've also visited Fitzroy and seen the location myself, and I was also able to assure people of the united support for the people of the Falkland Islands in this house for their defence and for their security. Yeah. But can I press him on this point about the timing? Are we talking here in terms of weeks? Are we talking months? Or are we talking years? Because time is moving on, and we need these questions. Um, well, yes. look, I'm not going to be drawn on precise times, but not years. Natalie Elfie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Oliver Richardson, now the Mayor of Deal, was just 21 when he survived the sinking of the Galahad. Forty years on, he says to me that there is no reason for this supposed secretly, that secrecy, that many people were neither offered nor a wanted confidentiality in relation to just saying what they had seen. Our armed services... They serve us all, and we must honour that service by giving them and the families of those lost and injured on the Galahad the answers they need. I would urge the Minister to release all of the Falklands Galahad papers at pace. Um, well, the Government will do everything it can in the interest of transparency, but we, like everybody else, are bound by the Data Protection Act, and I am sure she appreciates that. Henry Smith. Question two, sir. Sure, State. And Mr Speaker, the UK is committed to free and open Indo-Pacific and we're putting our regional approach on a long-term strategic footing. And I have just returned this weekend from Australia where we've been talking to our uh, colleagues there working hard on the Indo-Pacific programme. Henry Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Stability in the Indo-Pacific has been largely aided by the military base presence on Diego Garcia. What assessment has my right honourable friend, the Defence Secretary, made of the military base 
and the island of Diego Garcia remaining under full British sovereignty uh, so that we can help counter the many threats of the modern world, whether that be China, Iran or others. So stay. Well, as I think my honourable friend knows, uh, I absolutely share uh, the uh, goal of making sure that uh, that base, uh, Diego Garcia, uh, remains permanently available uh, for our use and indeed for the United States. It's strategically positioned, it's absolutely vital, and I think there is read across to uh, other uh, military facilities we have elsewhere. Uh, it remains uh, safe in our hands. Tim Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When assessing our ability to influence the stability of that region or any other, has the Secretary of State conducted any kind of an impact assessment on uh, the impact of our reduction from 0.7% of GDP uh, invested in uh, international aid, or indeed the fact that we have the smallest standing army in the United Kingdom for 200 years? So, well, so. Mr. Speaker, the, the honourable gentleman will uh, recognise, right, honourable gentleman, recognise that uh, I look after the defence rather than the overseas development budget. But I can tell him, and I think he'll welcome this, that now, because of the Indo-Pacific tilt, we have uh, ships permanently uh, with a presence there, HMS Spey and Tamar, and uh, also a littoral response group south, which operates in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we've already sent the carrier strike group previously. It's going again next year. Uh, to the region, and that's in addition to the GCAP sixth generation programme and, of course, AUKUS, for which I was in Australia this weekend. I think we can all agree we're doing a lot more than ever before in the Indo Pacific. Secretary of State, Shadow Secretary of State John Peel. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you have, I want to pay tribute to the Armed Forces Minister at his last defence oral questions. Mr. Speaker, since the last election, we've had five chancellors four Foreign Secretaries, three Prime Ministers, two Defence Secretaries, but only one Armed Forces Minister. He has been a rare constant in the turmoil of government, totally committed to defence. We thank him for that and we wish him well. Uh, Mr Speaker, on the Indo-Pacific, we welcome uh, last week's updated defence agreement with Australia and further progress on AUKUS and today's 10-year plan for Barrow to support August. This is our most important strategic alliance beyond NATO. So why does the Defence Secretary, given leadership of key parts of AUKUS, to the most junior minister in his department? Well, as I just explained, I've just been in Australia talking about AUKUS. I've previously been to Japan, I think at least twice, possibly three times on AUKUS, to Italy. Uh, 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 sorry, not to Italy, obviously, on AUKUS. Uh, it's on GCAT, but with an Indo-Pacific tilt. But I'm interested to hear, I do absolutely agree with the right honourable gentleman, his comments about my honourable friend, but I am interested to hear his comments on the Indo-Pacific, because back in 2021, when the Integrated Review suggested a tilt to the Indo-Pacific, he called it a serious flaw in the programme and urged us not to defocus uh, from elsewhere in the world. Liz Twist. Question three, Mr Speaker. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, with other government departments, the Ministry of Defence delivers a range of services to our brilliant veterans and their families. This includes the administration and payment of armed forces pensions and compensation, the provision of tailored advice and assistance through the Veterans Welfare Service, Defence Transition Services and the Integrated Personal Commissioning for Veterans. Scrooped. Minister, it's scrooped, I think. Uh, well, uh, um, with permission, uh, Mr Speaker, I am answering questions 3, 4, 9 and 16 together. Excellent. Thank you. Liz Twist. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A new report by Northumbria University <coughs> found that suicide among serving personnel and veterans could be reduced if there was better understanding within existing care provision of the specific challenges they face. The report also found that military families felt unheard, misunderstood and not cared for during the most difficult periods of their lives. So what steps is the Minister taking alongside our NHS to deliver compassionate, trauma-informed support for serving personnel and veterans? 
Minister. Well, I'm very glad she has raised that um, with me. Um, she will know that we have a defence suicide prevention strategy, which is reviewed regularly. She will also know that overall suicide in the armed forces is below uh, what we might expect uh, in the civilian population. There's a subgroup within that, that's young men, uh, where it does look as if the rate is going up. We're looking very close at that to better understand the reasons for it and how we can prevent it. Okay, to learn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to raise the, uh, an issue on behalf of my constituent who joined the Army in 1987 and served in Queen's Lancashire Regiment until 1994. During a, a wrongful operation, he severed all the nerves in his feet. He is now 52 years old and suffers from several conditions which leaves him in excruciating pain every day. He was previously on disability living allowance and then moved to PIP, but 18 months ago he was told he was no longer eligible. Is that really the way to treat our veterans? Minister. Well, I'm very sorry to hear about the Honourable Lady's constituent, and if she'd like to write to me with some details, I'd be more than happy to take it up. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, we work with other government departments, and it does sound as if this is something that's not principally the responsibility for the MOD, but I'd be more than happy to hear from her about her constituent. Awesome. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, about a year ago, the Honourable Member for Exxon undertook a very important and groundbreaking piece of work on behalf of um, female veterans and women in the armed forces. Following that, I had the honour of helping her set up the APBG on women in defence. That has given a platform to female veterans, female service personnel, as well as those working in defence and in the charitable sector to talk to members across the House and at every level. Um, and we're very much looking forward to the female veteran strategy. Uh, can I ask my right honourable friend for an assurance uh, that this government remains committed to not just equal treatment for women in the armed forces, but also an equally positive experience for every woman who chooses to serve? Yeah, I absolutely can give my honourable friend that assurance. I pay tribute to him and our honourable friend, the member for Wrexham, for all the hard work that they have done to improve the position of women in our armed forces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are absolutely central to where the way, the way defence will, will be going in the years ahead, uh, as encapsulated in our target to have 30 per cent of our armed forces female by 2030, a challenging and ambitious target. Uh, I would mention the improvements we have made to uniform policies, uh, mentoring, uh, flexible service, wraparound childcare and, of course, our zero, zero tolerance to USB as examples of things that we have done very recently to improve the lived experience of women in our armed forces. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the last census, there were just over 17,000 veterans living in Birmingham, and of those, 35 per cent of them were over the age of 80. Despite split Despite pledging to end veterans' homelessness, last year government figures show that it actually rose by 14 per cent, with up to 180 veterans' households across the UK being made newly homeless each month. So can the minister tell me what he is doing to make sure our veterans in Birmingham and across the UK who made our, their enormous sacrifices for our safety and security do, do not end up homeless? Thank you. It is plainly um, not right that anybody should be without a home, whether they are a veteran or not. Uh, what I would say to the Honourable Lady is that uh, we are doing everything in our power to ensure that people, as they transition out of the armed forces, are set up well for civilian life, and the overwhelming majority of people who leave our armed forces are precisely in that position. Uh, so using things like the Defence Transition Service, for example, for those who might have particular problems when they return to civilians, as all members of the armed forces ultimately do, uh, we're ensuring that we minimise the number of people who have served in our armed forces who are left without a home. Mark Pritch. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, is the Minister aware of the excellent work of the Battle Back Centre in Lillishaw in my constituency, a collaboration, a successful collaboration between the Royal British uh, Legion and Sport England. And would he consider visiting there quite soon, or perhaps his colleague, the Veterans Minister, given they've treated over 6,000 serving and ex-service personnel of all sorts of injuries? The staff there are fabulous, superb, and they deserve a visit. Minister. 
Well, I'm very grateful to Honourable Friend for the invite, which I will most gladly uh, take up. Battleback does a wonderful job. I pay tribute to what it does, and also to my Honourable Friend for the, uh, for, for the work he has done in supporting them. Their man to Thank you, Mr Speaker. Morley veteran Roy Sagar recently passed away in his mid-90s, a familiar face to us all in Morley. Roy has done so much for veterans and for the Royal British Legion locally and has been our parade marshal. Would my honourable friend join me in paying tribute to Roy and all our unsung hero veterans and thank them for all they do and send our thoughts and prayers to Roy's family? Uh, yes, I very much would do so. Um, uh, uh, our, our veterans are a wonderful part of our, our communities. Uh, they deserve all the support we, we can give them. And I'd also just like to pay tribute to the Royal British Legion that's always there for our veterans when they, when they need it. And I speak as president of my local branch. The, the Legion is a, is a very powerful institution. Uh, Mr Speaker, I know uh, you've had a lot to do with it. It's an important part of, of what we are and who we are. I pay tribute to it, as well as to my uh, honourable friend's um, late constituent. Shall the Minister Steve McKay? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the Minister's earlier answer, but is there a need for more urgent intervention when the Royal British Legion Industries say there are 6,000 veterans homeless or in danger of becoming so, or is the Minister for the OVA right to hail getting 500 off the streets as a triumph? Well, I think getting 500 off the street is, is, is um, something uh, that, is, that is good and it should certainly be a start, but I would say to the Honourable um, gentlemen, that one person without a home is one too many, whether they are a civilian uh, or a veteran. Uh, the important thing is we look at factors which might be peculiar to defence that predisposes people to homelessness, because I think we have a particular duty to those people in accordance with the military covenant. In general, he knows, I know, uh, that uh, people leaving the armed forces are much better placed uh, for uh, the balance of their lives and civilian life than an equivalent person in civil society. Uh, but that isn't the case. Some people fall uh, in the cracks, and we must make sure that they're scooped up and looked after. Ian Blackford. Question number five, Mr Speaker. Minister yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, thank you very much indeed for your words at the beginning of the session, and so too to the right honourable gentleman, the Shadow Secretary of State. Um, both of you very kind indeed to say what you said. Um, the UK Armed Forces are meeting all of their commitments, but there's no mistaking that they are very busy, uh, as you would expect, uh, in such a turbulent geopolitical time. People across the Army, Navy, Air Force and Strategic Command are working incredibly hard, and we're very grateful to them and their families for their forbearance whilst they do so. Um, the Government is investing £1.95 billion extra in our resilience and readiness. But more than investment is needed, Mr Speaker, and that is why all three services are getting back into the business of being ready for war fighting. The 3rd United Kingdom Division recently exercised its combat service support echelons for the first time in decades. Um, the Royal Navy is operating concurrent task groups as well as Ford Presence, a test for our, narrative, uh, our naval uh, logistics, and the Royal Air Force uh, is refining its abilities to disperse the force for its, combat, for its agile combat employment mechanism. Ian Blackford. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And of course, we commend the efforts of all in our armed services, but the Defence Committee Ready for War report sustains that our armed forces are constantly overstretched and are being deployed above their capacity. So when are the government going to respond appropriately to the scale of geopolitical challenges, drive up recruitment and retention, and make sure that we face the challenges that we see ahead of us, we can take them full on and we're ready for whatever comes our way? Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, there's no escaping that the world is incredibly complicated at the moment. In the Euro-Atlantic, the challenge of Russia in the Middle East, the challenge of Iran and its proxies uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the growing competition with China, and then across Africa and other parts of the world, there remains the challenge of violent extremism. But in a time of such crisis, one would expect the armed forces to be exactly as busy as they are. That doesn't mean we should take for granted the effort that they are putting in. But if we weren't reaching for them as extensively as we are right now, you'd have to question when on earth you would reach for them, given the demands on our nation right now. Richard Drax. Mr Speaker, can I pay tribute to my honourable and gallant friend, the Armed Forces Minister, that I am very sad to hear he is going. 
He talks of war fighting, as he knows I'm on the Defence Committee. I would challenge the fact that we are ready to fight a sustained war with the armed forces that we have, and bearing in mind all the threats that we've faced, that's become very real. Would he now, bearing in mind collective responsibility is about to go, stand at the dispatch box and say we need to spend a lot more money on defence? Well, Mr Speaker, uh, it's soon, but not yet. Uh, although, <laughs> although our colleagues on both sides of the House will note that uh, on every opportunity when I've been invited to respond to such a question, um, like all good defence ministers, I never miss the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to say no. Um, but the, the reality is, is that our armed forces remain fierce. You know, yes, it is the job of this House, and particularly the Honourable Gentleman's Committee, to scrutinise as they have our readiness, and I commend the report to the House if colleagues haven't already read it. Um, our armed forces do need reinvestment in their ability to sustain themselves at a war-fighting level. That's no scandal. That is the consequence of a peace dividend that allowed successive governments to rightly disinvest in the resilience that kept our Cold War force credible. But as the Secretary of State so rightly said in his speech the other week, we're now in a pre-war era. era and so it's the responsibility of this government and those that follow to reinvest in that necessary war fighting capability. John Speller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. But the Minister rightly points about the ability to sustain fighting. He knows that an exercise conducted with the Americans showed that the British Army would run out of munitions within 10, within ten days. The, uh, the, the, the battles in Ukraine showed very early on this was going to be an artillery war. Why did it take? From, I've asked this question to several ministers, so I hope he's got the answer now. Why did it take from March or April of 22 to July 23 to actually place the orders for new munitions? We cannot afford this sort of delay within the Ministry of Defence. Well, Mr. Speaker, the contract has now been placed and increases our supply of 155 significantly. Uh, I just take issue with the uh, exercise, the Honourable Gentleman says. I'm not aware of the one that he's specifically referring to. In exercises that I have seen, where the UK have operated alongside the US, uh, what happens again and again and again is that American senior commanders hold the UK force elements in the highest of regard. Thank you, sir. As I used to do his job, can I also join the tributes? to the outgoing, outstanding Armed Forces Minister. Yeah. The Ready for War report just referenced identified problems with recruitment as one reason that deters our ability to fight. The Defence Secretary himself called our recruitment system ludicrous, and he told the Times earlier this month, I quote, that the Amazon generation, which is used to getting things instantly, were not prepared to wait a year to join the army. He's absolutely right. So when will the utterly ludicrous crapita finally be sacked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm unable to uh, answer the Honourable Gentleman's specific question, but he, he will be heartened to hear that as a consequence of all that is going on in the world and the geopolitical uncertainty that requires us to use our armed forces so extensively, in recent months we've enjoyed record expressions of interest in joining His Majesty's armed forces. Obviously, what we need to do is to make sure that from that moment of expressing interest to starting training is as short as possible, and all colleagues on the front bench to see the need to do that. Sloan Saxby. Question six, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and with your permission, I'd like to answer questions 6 and 20 together. The most recent estimate shows that the MOD supports around 209,000 jobs in industries across the UK, and I'm pleased to confirm this, fig this figure will be boosted further by confirmation last week that BAE Systems will partner in Australia to build their nuclear-powered submarines, supporting 7,000 additional British jobs across the programme's lifespan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would my honourable friend agree that MOD procurement with small British companies in rural areas like North Devon can significantly increase defence-related jobs, enhance the local economy, especially when in high-wage R&D and manufacturing industries? Will he commit to ensuring that additional high-skilled jobs and economic benefits of future contracts be considered in procurement decisions? 
Minister. Well, it's an excellent point from my honourable friend, who is a champion of defence SMEs in her constituency. As to procurement rules supporting SMEs like those in North Devon, our new integrated procurement model will ensure that UK industrial capability and exportability considerations are included in procurement evaluation criteria, such as on new medium helicopter. But to ensure we absolutely maximise opportunities for British industry, on Friday I also announced, Mr Speaker, that we will be undertaking a rapid review of how Cabinet Office social value rules impact upon the development of sovereign capability. Mark Paulson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the successful export order for high-value naval electric propulsion technology that's manufactured by GE in my rugby constituency that's going to Singapore, achieved by, through the assistance of both the MOD and the Department of Business and Trade. Um, will he agree that this shows how support for this uh, world-leading British technology enables new business in a fast-developing part of the world while providing significant new high-value jobs for my constituents? Well, again, my honourable friend asked an excellent question, and I do welcome the valuable contribution of GE uh, in his constituency in supplying high-tech motors, including for Royal Navy ships such as the Type 26 frigates and Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers. And it was precisely because the Ministry of Defence recognises the importance of GE's rugby facility that we were pleased to have reached an agreement with the company in 2019 to ensure these motors continue to be manufactured there. Finally, he's right about export. That's why it's such a key part of our new integrated procurement model, because it boosts industrial resilience, prosperity in constituency like his, but also it strengthens international alliances, Mr Speaker, such as in this case with the people of Singapore and the Singapore Navy. Mr Speaker, um, the Secretary of State will know that uh, Huddersfield is a centre for defence uh, industries. David Brown Gears, Reliance Engineering. Um, I talk to them regularly. They say to me, one of the things that, it is, that they miss is the trained personnel. The Army, the Navy and Air Force used to be the biggest trainer of personnel in the country and the diminished level of training in the armed services is reflected in the sector. They can't get enough highly trained people to actually employ. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm aware of those companies, and they do do an excellent job supporting the supply chain, particularly into our primes and on key programmes, particularly naval programmes. But I don't, I don't recognise the description uh, he uses in relation to training. Um, as he will be aware, I believe uh, Defence is the biggest uh, employer of uh, apprenticeships in the country, but we're doing everything we can to support that. And a key way, Mr Speaker, is by a close relationship with industry, bringing them into our requirements early on so that they can plan and deliver the supply signal, particularly in terms of skills, to match our demand signal. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'd like to build on the incisive question from the Right Honourable Member for Rayleigh and Wickford. Over 125,000 applicants to the British Army were rejected during the last five years. It's emerged that 70% of applicants were dropped or withdrew at the paperwork stage. More than 8,000 withdrew their applications after having waited for at least six months. What consequences will Capita face for this record? And when might the Army bring soldier and officer recruitment back in-house? Well, he, I think I would encourage him to uh, direct questions about recruitment to the Minister for uh, Def D uh, Defence and Families Personnel. Uh, as to the company he talks about, my focus is on industry, on supporting jobs, which this question is actually about. And I think we've got a fantastic record, boosted by not only the exports that I referred to earlier, but the exports such as my honourable friend for rugby was talking about. Maria Riedel, Shadow Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr Speaker. Defence procurement can strengthen UK sovereignty, security and economic growth. <coughs> and on uh, this side of the House, we believe defence investment should be directed first to UK businesses so we make buy and sell more in Britain. But with that in mind, what steps is he taking in his rapid review to ensure that social value considerations properly take into account the huge advantages to the UK economy of awarding more contracts to British businesses so that we create more defence jobs here in the UK, because they don't seem to do so at present. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to say to the Honourable Lady, um, I think there's a considerable consensus here, because I do agree with her about the importance of sovereign defence capability. But if I may say, it isn't just because of the economic benefits, although, are, although they are absolutely crucial. 
But as we enter this era, which has been described as pre-war, it's vital that we have a UK sovereign industrial base, because as the Ukrainians have learnt, we, there are certain skills, capabilities we need to have in the UK should we get to a hotter military situation, and that's why it's such a priority for us. Dear Mather. Question 7, Mr Speaker. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I refer the honourable gentleman to much that I said in response to the readiness question earlier, but the key point of addressing this um, issue with enablement is that it's the really unglamorous stuff that needs to be invested in first. There's no point buying more tanks until we've got more tank transporters. The government is seized of that and is doing exactly that. Um, and Mr Speaker, it's an opportunity to just place on record, in addition to my gratitude to the armed forces in response to the previous question, that there are tens of thousands of very hard-working MOD civil servants, both in main building and around the wider enterprise, who are hard at work on exactly this problem right now, and I'm very grateful to them for efforts. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister, like other colleagues, for his years of service. Since 2010, the size of our armed forces has decreased by over 43,000 personnel. The number of Royal Navy warships has decreased by one in five, and more than 200 aircraft have been removed from service in just the last five years, with recruitment targets being missed year on year. Of which of these legacies of 14 years of Conservative government is the Minister most proud, and what actions could he be undertaking to do better? Minister. Mr Speaker, I think the thing that I am most proud of beyond the exceptional operational output by His Majesty's Armed Forces every time that they're called upon, is that this government has increased the defence budget to more than £50 billion per year for the first time. And the honourable gentleman, whose, new, whose interest in defence is very welcome indeed, should be enormously concerned that the Shadow Chancellor has repeatedly refused to commit to anything more than the 2% NATO floor for defence spending. And if his concern for defence is to last, he should be immediately concerned that that would equal a £7 billion cut on defence spending on day one of a Labour government unless his party changes policy urgently. James Sunderland. Mr Speaker, the question of whether our armed forces are fit for purpose should, of course, centre on whether they can meet the defence tasks set by the MOD which I believe they can. In the same vein as the previous question, does the Minister agree with me that Labour's failure to commit to more than 2% of GDP for defence spending presents a much bigger risk to UK security than any objective debate on this side of the House? Mr Speaker, absolutely. 2.5 per cent of GDP should be achieved urgently. The fiscal situation is improving, uh, and this party has made that commitment. And as the Secretary of State said rightly in an interview the other day, both parties should be strongly considering a further increase in defence spending in the next Parliament. Senator Minister Maria Reid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the former Defence Secretary told this House last January, the Government has hollowed out and underfunded the UK military over the last 14 years, but this is in large part due to their total failure in armed forces recruitment. And now damning new figures show over the last decade 800,000 people willing to serve and defend their country simply gave up and withdrew their applications. The current Defence Secretary himself says the recruitment system is ludicrous. Um, The organisation that are running it got called the wrong name by an honourable gentleman on the other side of the House. But where is the current plan to fix this recruitment system? Is it working? Mr Speaker, the honourable lady is conflating two separate issues. The former Secretary of State for Defence and I, and everybody else who served on the government front bench since we've returned to the prospect of state-on-state war, has referred to a hollowing out of the force. It isn't the consequence decisions just made by this government. It's the consequence decisions made by government since the fall of the Berlin Wall, because the force that we maintained for the Cold War and all of its enablement was not necessary when we were fighting counterinsurgency campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. That is what is meant by hollowing out. And the sooner that the Honourable Lady starts to deal with that as an issue, rather than conflate it with others to make political points, the sooner that she'll start to contribute to a very important debate. Now, as far as recruitment goes, a record level of interest has been shown in joining our nation armed forces, and there is no hiding from the fact that we need to rapidly accelerate the way that people go from expression of interest to being in training. Can we accelerate the questions with it? Chris Stevens. Uh, number eight, Mr. Speaker. Oh, Mr. Speaker. 
The UK continually assesses potential threats to our overseas territories, including the sovereign base areas on the island of Cyprus. British Forces Cyprus provides a permanent military presence, and we are investing in the SBAs to combat current and future threats to ensure local, regional and global security. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for the response. Uh, his colleague, the Secretary of State, has stated in the past that we want to do everything possible to ensure the security of Cyprus. So does the Minister agree that keeping the Cypriot government informed of all UK military oper operations it conducts from their island is appropriate and should be an official obligation for the security of Cyprus? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, SBAs are sovereign bases and therefore, of course, we reserve the right to operate from them as we need, uh, based on the UK national interest. But the Honourable Gentleman will be reassured to hear that the Secretary of State, uh, his predecessors, me and other ministers in the Department have very good relations with the Cypriots, and we do indeed seek to tell them as much as we possibly can about the operations that we are mounting from those bases. James Gray. Speaker, I can add to the warm words that been said about my right honourable friend member for Wells. Um, he has been particularly supportive of the All Party Parliamentary Group for the Armed Forces and of the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme, both of which I chair, and he's, throughout he has been hugely supportive of it. Would you agree with me that uh, the, the sovereign base in Cyprus has been a particularly important role to play in our activities uh, in the Red Sea? Uh, yes, sir. Mr Speaker, Cyprus is in an incredibly important strategic location, which means that it is of great use to our current operations in the Southern Red Sea, as well as the Eastern Mediterranean, the Western Balkans, uh, across into Central Asia and beyond. It is uh, a vital mounting base for so much that the UK Armed Forces do, and we're incredibly fortunate to have that facility. David Simmons. Number 10, Secretary of State. Mr Speaker, with permission, I should like to ask, answer 10, 18 and 19 together. There is a desperate need for increased humanitarian support to Gaza and the UK, including the MOD, is working collectively with allies, partners and international organisations to deliver that desperate needed aid uh, for the Gazan population. David Simmons. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents are rightly proud of the work our armed forces are doing to facilitate the delivery of aid to prevent a colossal humanitarian catastrophe. But what further steps can be taken to ensure that this British aid finds its way to civilians in need rather than into the hands of Hamas fighters? Well, Mr Speaker, this is of course one of the greatest challenges of the situation at the moment. And we're working with the British Red Cross, with UNICEF, with the UN World Food Programme, with the Egyptian Red Crescent and others in order to ensure that that does indeed get to the right place. It is extremely <coughs> challenging. It has been one of the things which has slowed down the process of that aid delivery. Will Quint. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Israeli government has said that it wants to flood Gaza with aid. Will my right honourable friend assure the House that we will work with our partners globally to ensure that we're getting more aid into Gaza, into the hands of civilians, and that we assist the Israelis to deliver on this pledge as soon as possible? Absolutely, Mr Speaker. And I can inform my honourable friend we have already delivered 74 tonnes of humanitarian aid via the RAF, 87 tonnes uh, through the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Uh, but we are pursuing, in addition to that, uh, routes via land, via air and via maritime. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With half of Gaza already starving and the rest teetering on the edge of famine, with the, US security, with the UN Security Council voting for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, access to humanitarian aid is crucial. The Foreign Secretary stated this month that the UK would support the building of a temporary pier to Gaza in Gaza to allow hundreds of extra daily truckloads of aids into the Strip. Can the Minister outline what steps he is taking, along with the Foreign Secretary, to ensure that this pier is constructed as quickly as possible? Um, the, the Right Honourable Lady will be pleased to hear that uh, I have sent uh, teams both to Tampa to work with CENTCOM and also to uh, the region uh, in order to help with the assistance of uh, constructing uh, that pier and the planning for it. In addition, right at the beginning of this uh, conflict, I ensured that we did hydrographic uh, research in order to aid exactly this kind of um, situation when the conditions were right to get a pier built. This is not a trivial endeavour, uh, but we're working to deliver it as quickly as possible with the potential of getting two and a half million meals in to Gaza a day. Mr. Speaker, of course, the ability for the UK government 
to deliver humanitarian aid depends upon the relationship the UK has with its Middle Eastern partners. So what impact does the Minister think recent events and recent UK Government decisions in foreign policy has had upon this crucial relationship with those Middle Eastern partners? Well, the Honourable Lady will be pleased to hear that uh, both myself and the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister have been uh, very proactive in both speaking to and indeed multiply visiting the region. I think I've uh, visited the majority of countries uh, in the Middle East and the Gulf region to discuss exactly the points that she's uh, raised. There is now this very big scale, large scale programme of using a peer. Uh, to get uh, food in, in addition to the many e other efforts that have been uh, made. As my honourable friend pointed out, it's not just getting it in there, it is the distribution once it's there that is great concern. St. Peace spokesperson, Dev Dugan. Um, when will the Government make a further public determination on Israel's commitment to international humanitarian law, uh, given the man made famine now unfolding in northern Gaza and compounded by Israeli moves to obstruct the access of aid? And in the event that the UK's subsequent assessment finds, as the UN Secretary General, Human, right Watch, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International have found, that the Israeli Government and the IDF have violated international law, what steps will the UK Government to, uh, make to prohibit further arms sales uh, to um, Israel pending a better resolution of this situation. And given that the Security Council has just now called for a ceasefire, what steps can the government make through the defence sector to accelerate all available aid for civilians in Gaza? I think it's a pity to ask all those questions without referencing the 100 plus hostages which are still being held by Hamas after they brutally slaughtered uh, population uh, deliberately rather than as a product byproduct of war. Uh, the, uh, but he asked a number of questions. Uh, I can tell him that the, uh, that the, the issue of arms exports, the thing for which I'm responsible, just to put this in proportion, is I think just £48 million from uh, the top of my head for last year to Israel. The numbers are actually uh, very small indeed, uh, but he'll know that this is a question for the FCDO. Thanks, Mr. Number 12, please, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to answer questions 12, 14 and 15 together. The Department uses a range of measures to assess the effectiveness of defence acquisition. We have reduced the average time taken to deliver our projects and programmes, but we must go further to drive pace, so last month I announced our new integrated procurement model. Thanks, Smith. Mr Speaker, the National Audit Office has previously highlighted MOD pilot training procurement. Failures. So can I ask the Minister if the, the RAF is now meeting its pilot training quotas and is the Minister satisfied with progress in this key area? Well, the Honourable Gentleman asked a very important question. Of course, training is, is fundamental uh, to, the, uh, to, to bring in the next generation uh, to man our capability. And uh, I have recently had the pleasure to visit RAF Valley, where I discussed this uh, issue with the RAF. And they were able to confirm to me that for the first time in a long time, there were more students um, taking up their places rather than in holds. That is a key metric where we are seeing significant progress, but yes, we do want to go further. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At last March, the government said they would have their AJEC scheme ready between October 2028 and September 2029. Given that only 25% of armoured vehicles have been produced, are the government on target to meet this deadline? Minister? Yes. Colin Mahmood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Notwithstanding the waste of five billion pounds in procurement since 2019, will you join my the right honourable shadow Secretary of State for Defence in the campaign to make in Britain uh, to ensure that our industry and our economy moves together to support not just defence but our economy as well? But how will you achieve that with Tata cutting down the blast furnace capacity? with four, £500 million pounds paid by us to them, uh, and how will we be able to proceed with the AUKUS contract and other contracts without virgin steel? Yeah, yeah. Well, on the important question of steel, we don't expect the uh, closure of Port Talbot to have a significant impact on defence, but obviously we will continue to monitor that situation. But I would just gently point out, in the last year for which we have figures available, 22-23, 
89% of spend by the Ministry of Defence with industry was, it was with British industry, Mr Speaker. But it's going to be an awful lot harder for them to make that level of spend if they are unable to commit to matching our spending commitments. So if he's so concerned, perhaps he'll join with other colleagues on the opposite side in insisting that the Shadow Secretary of State confirms whether he's going to match 2.3% now and our target of 2.5% as soon as the economy supports it. Luke Shelbrook. Speaker, I may just take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to also place on record my thanks to my right hon. and gallant friend for Wales for all the work he's done. It was indeed a, a joy to work with him when I was in the department. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may I first of all thank my um, honourable friend for his um, procurement review. It's an excellent document, and moving forward in the way that are the pragmatic ways forward. Um, can I ask him, as part of um, the review and moving forward, that he does a reassessment of potential gaps that may occur between all platforms being retired? along with the delays that have come to new platforms. And my also, does he agree with me that um, the housing procurement side, accommodation for um, forces, is actually an operational capability as much as a tank is? Well, There's my honourable friend makes an excellent point. He made a similar point in the debate uh, last week on readiness about the importance of accommodation, because I think we can all agree there is a tendency in defence to focus on the big shiny platforms. Actually, accommodation is a key priority. We're very committed to improving accommodation. We know that the winter before this one uh, performance was not satisfactory. That's why, first of all, we put, on the, put in the extra investment, £400 million extra, and we announced the winter plan. And I'm pleased to say we've made huge progress, for example, uh, ensuring thousands of properties have work achieved on damp and mould improvements. Ronald Jolander. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted that the Minister of Defence has confirmed the procurement of additional Chinooks, uh, given that RAF Odium in my constituency is the home of the Chinook Force. Um, but it's also home to their frontline maintenance, second line engine repair, and in depth upgrade and modification. Given that 85% of Chinook fleet sustainment takes place in the UK today, can I have my honourable friend's assurance that RAF Odium will remain the home of the Chinook and that a similar, if not higher, amount of maintenance of the new variants will take place here and across Britain? Well, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. I very much enjoyed my visit to Odium, and we discussed a wide range of issues, but he's absolutely right to draw attention to the fact we've committed to this procurement of 14 extended range Chinooks. They have uh, a, a huge range, 1,000 miles. But as he says, in particular, I wanted to stress there is industrial benefit to the UK and, of course, to his constituency, because I can confirm that within that procurement, not only have we made a £300 million saving, but it also includes a £150 million benefit to UK prosperity. Jack Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask my honourable friend to update the House on progress made with UK-Ukraine defence manufacturing cooperation, especially in regard to removing the hurdles? I mean, is there anything more the government should be doing? Well, my honourable friend has championed this consistently, and I'm pleased to say we held the first UK trade mission in December, and we will be having further such missions. But I can confirm, most importantly, that following that mission, uh, UK defence companies and the Ukrainian government have signed agreements, including Babcock being awarded a three-year contract by the Ukraine Ministry of Defence to support and maintain two mine countermeasure vessels. BA Systems and AMS Integrated Solutions have signed an agreement that will enable them to offer specialised artillery system support directly to the Ukrainian armed forces. And finally, TALIS have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ukrainian drone company Aerodrone, which will bring together the best of Ukrainian and Northern Irish engineering to deliver new capability for Ukraine's armed forces. SNP spokesperson Dev Dugan. Uh, procurement of the new medium lift helicopter has been characteristically suboptimal in, uh, under this government, but this particular defence procurement minister has managed, with his inverse Midas touch, to ensure that costs have grown from 1 billion, uh, circa 1 billion to 1.3 billion. Delivery forecasts have slipped six years to 2031, and the number of assets that will be received has gone from 44 down to 35. With this budget invariably going to slip to the right, with the uh, service personnel going to be under-resourced and the budget almost certainly going to grow, what possible confidence can anyone have in this defence procurement? Minister. Well, <laughs> I, I won't take any lectures from the Honourable yeah. General. His party yeah. is yeah. unable yeah. even to procure a ferry. Yeah. <laughs> but, when it, but when it comes to the 
new medium helicopter, and it doesn't say here, I know the subject, and I can confirm to him, because I'm very proud of this, Mr. Speaker, at my insistence, our competition for the new medium helicopter, which is what his question was about, will have a far greater emphasis both on supporting UK industry and on supporting exports, because Where? it's by supporting exports that we have industrial resilience and support pr prosperity across the United Kingdom. Of course, it's a competition, but we have three very good entries. Come to Topicals, Nigel Mills. Number two, please, sir. Tuesday. Well, Mr. Speaker, like uh, others in this House, I want to pay tribute to my right honourable and gallant friend, a soldier, MP, minister for nearly the entire Parliament. His knowledge is only matched by his great passion for the subject, and we are all very grateful for his service. Uh, last week, I was in Australia signing a historic defence treaty uh, to enhance our Indo Pacific security and at the same time our trilateral AUKUS partnership with the United States uh, is accelerating and uh, as the House will know ASC and BAE systems uh, have a multi-billion pound contract for the SSN uh, AUKUS and earlier today the Prime Minister and I launched our first ever nuclear defence command paper which will be for the first time will set out the true benefit of this great enterprise making it a whole national effort. Nigel Mills. Can I thank you for the answer and can I welcome the command paper being published this morning, especially the important role that Rolls-Royce and Derby play in it. Would you agree for it to be a truly national enterprise? There needs to be a truly national supply chain and access to jobs for people right across the country as well. Well, honourable friend is absolutely uh, right about the uh, extent of the supply chain and in addition to the uh, very large uh, investment in uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, for which the Australians put £2.4 billion in uh, last week, uh, and all of the work in uh, Barrow uh, that the command paper talks about today, there are benefits for virtually every single constituency up and down the country. Joe Secretary of State, John Healy. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We condemn the deadly terrorist attacks in Moscow on Friday, and our thoughts are with all those who are affected. But the attack must not become a Kremlin cover for Putin's illegal war in Ukraine. And in recent days, we have seen multiple Russian strikes on Ukrainian cities, yet the last UK air defence support was announced last year. When is the next one? Well, Mr uh, Speaker, first of all, I join the right honourable gentleman in uh, his uh, sending the condolences on that horrific terror uh, attack. He's absolutely right to say there is no connection whatsoever that we're aware of uh, with Ukraine, uh, and indeed ISIS have, re have uh, claimed responsibility. We must resist Putin's efforts to try to link the two. Uh, with regard to uh, air defence, in fact, there have been much more recent uh, attempts to uh, uh, aid our Ukrainian friends, including for the, through the International Fund for Ukraine, which has laid 27 contracts. Uh, we have a £900 million fund uh, run by uh, the UK on behalf of a large number of other countries. John Healy. Yes. Anything more recent, of course, was from the Ukrainian fund for Ukraine, not from the UK, which is why we strongly welcomed the £2.5 billion of UK military support for 2024. But, Mr Speaker, for nearly three months since that announcement, Ministers have said that the first deliveries to Ukraine won't happen until Q1 of the new financial year. And wars do not follow financial years. So when will the UK move beyond this stop-start military aid and help Ukraine now with the spring-summer offensive? Well, Mr Speaker, I can tell the right hand gentleman, we have a constant flow of uh, foreign material that we're buying and sending exactly. into Ukraine. Uh, I announced just recently £325 million pounds uh, for Ukraine for drones uh, with British Ukrainian drones. And we've increased the amount of money overall going to Ukraine to £2.5 billion from the previous two years, £2.3 billion. I will just gently say to the right honourable gentleman, because it's been raised by a couple of my colleagues today, uh, he needs to explain how his side would manage an increased budget to Ukraine when their plan is to cut £7 billion pounds off the overall defence budget. Andrew Slow. An uh, army non-serving partner says of her children's mental health treatment, and I quote very briefly, Mr Speaker, when you move, they close the case, and then you have to go all the way back through the system, which takes forever. By the time you get in, you're moving again. Can you give the House an update, please, on recommendations 74, 75 and 76, which deals with this issue on the Living in Our Shoes report? I'm, I'm grateful to my old friend and, as ever, pay tribute for the work he's done in this. Uh, it is the case when people move around the country, they are disadvantaged. We recognise that. 
which is why the Integrated Care Board is now doing a pilot on how we can get around this issue of people losing their place on waiting lists when they tra travel around the country. Obviously, this is an issue that involves other government departments. We have a responsibility, nevertheless, and we discharge that responsibility in, num in a number of ways. Give them an example. Uh, HeadFit is, is being uh, adapted and adopted at the moment to, to ensure that our veterans and, and our service families are able to access much of its content. The government has previously refused to confirm or deny whether Israeli F-35s have been using RAF air bases or indeed other military cooperation between the UK and Israel. Given the decision of the ICJ and now the decision of the UN Security Council to call for an immediate ceasefire, what are the operational or policy reasons that deny UK citizens the right to know whether their government has been complicit in Israeli genocide in Gaza? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we don't comment on operational matters of that yeah, sort. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Qatar hosts Hamas's most senior leaders in Doha and should have been applying far more pressure on the terror group to release the Israeli hostages and to surrender. So, does my right honourable friend agree that Qatar's malign activities bolsters our adversaries and therefore weakens our own defence? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not entirely sure I do agree. I mean, I'll, I'll leave the Foreign Office to. Uh, talk about the diplomatic angles that they are pursuing, but in my experience, Qatar has been an incredibly helpful partner across a whole load of things over the last few years, uh, and we enjoy the opportunity to strengthen that partnership, both through the sale uh, of UK-built defence capabilities, but also through increasingly operating together in areas of mutual concern. Uh, it's a relationship around which the UK uh, can build further and has great potential. I'm Thank you. Uh, HMS Albion is twinned with Chester and we deeply value the ship and her company. Can the Minister provide the next date HMS Albion and HMS Bulwark will be at sea or will he just admit he's mothballed them both? Well, the Honourable Lady will be pleased to know I was on HMS Albion the other week. It, she's not been uh, mothballed. It will be the case that the other ship is the first to sell. I don't know the timing. It will just depend on operational requirements, but they are both continuing in operation. Although, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, like many colleagues across the House, I attended the all-party parliamentary group for UK, Israel and Friends of Israel. We were joined by two released hostages and a delegation consisting of young siblings, sons, daughters, grandchildren and their families being held Sorry, and cousins who have members of their families being held hostage in Gaza. It's now five months since the hostages were taken. Can I just ask the Minister to ensure that these victims remain right at the front of mind of all decisions taken on the Middle East? Yeah. Well, my humble friend can have absolutely that uh, assurance. And if I may, uh, whilst it is shocking to see what is happening in the region, it is too often forgotten, I'm afraid, including in this House, today from some members opposite, that this all began with the taking of those hostages, and we will never forget. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Pension justice is on everybody's lips just now, so can the Minister tell me what this Government has done to support the 30,000 veterans who left the service before 1975 and have lost out on preserved pensions? Yeah, yeah. Minister. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. As he knows very well, consecutive governments have made it plain that we don't make changes retrospectively to pensions. As for pensions overall for the armed forces, Mr Speaker, you'll know, uh, as I do as a beneficiary, they are equitable, fair and generous. Dame Caroline Dining. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The 2016 Better Defence Estates plans are earmarked Fort Blockhouse in Gosport for disposal. Here we are eight years later with numerous delays, and that site is still rotting at taxpayers' expense, doing nothing for the local economy, nothing for the local community, and nothing for the MOD. Can the Minister please update me when we will finally see some progress on that site? Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, and I enjoyed my visit to her constituency where we looked at a range of infrastructure and accommodation. I appreciate that she wants to see progress here. I would just stress um, whilst we engage as closely as possible with Gosport Council on it and want to make progress, it is a very complex site. Um, there are significant defence assets still in place with DIO but also with the Royal Navy, but I'm committed to looking at what more we can do and to engaging further with her. Jessica Morden. Speaker, there are tens of thousands of pregnant women in Gaza suffering malnutrition and at serious risk of delivering their babies unsafely and without health care. Can the Minister outline what particular steps are taken along with the Foreign Secretary to support delivery of food, medical to supplies to these particularly vulnerable women? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, we are working to try to bring the supplies to uh, all of the uh, citizens of uh, Gaza. Uh, I didn't run through the list of provisions, but it does include provisions for those in medical need, and particularly uh, women who may be pregnant. As I mentioned earlier, we are working on plans with the Americans in particular, but also the Jordanians, to provide vastly uh, greater amounts of aid into Gaza. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the terrible. Uh, terrorist attacks in Moscow reminds us that jihadi extremism has not disappeared, given its ideology, its reach and its strength. Would the Secretary of State agree with me that uh, ISIS-K is very much a threat to the West as it is to Russia? Well, Mr. Speaker, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely right. Uh, there's a perception that Daesh has gone away. Daesh core is cooped up in prisons uh, in northern Syria, but uh, Daesh affiliates are growing um, alarmingly quickly in other parts of the world. And the attack in Moscow is a reminder to us all that we must continue to focus both on the counter-terror threat as well as the state threats. Final question, Dan Jarvis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I wish the Minister for the Armed Forces all the very best for his next posting? He will recall that on the 1st of February he made a commitment to reassess the Arab eligibility specifically for former members of the Triples, and he said that it's a process that would take 12 weeks. Can I ask him to give an update on the progress that's been made with that work to date? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's disappointing to finish on a down note, but uh, as the Honourable Gentleman knows from a written answer that I gave him earlier in the week, it has taken longer than I wanted to establish an independent group of new casework assessors, uh, and thus that 12-week period has not yet begun. I am told by officials when I reluctantly signed off the answer to him earlier in the week that that process is nigh on complete and thus the 12 weeks should start imminently and he won't be surprised to know that preempting the honourable gentleman's question I have encouraged them that eight weeks would sound awful, an awful lot better than 12 given the delay in getting started. Uh, complete questions. Point of order. Is it relating to defence questions? Dave Dugan. Mr Speaker, uh, at defence questions on the 8th of January, I asked the Defence Procurement Minister a very straightforward question about HMS Argyle, the type of question you would expect the Defence Procurement Minister to have an answer at his fingertips. But instead, he said as quickly and as curtly as he could that he would write to me with an answer. It's almost three months later, Mr Speaker, and I regret to inform you and the House I have received no such information from the Defence Procurement Minister, nor have I even received an acknowledgement that he intends to do so. Can I ask your advice that when honourable and right honourable members get a slippery minister on the hook and they choose to wriggle off it by promising to write to members and they then don't, what recourse, what recourse do Sit members of Parliament minute. have? Well, first of all, I think we ought to choose the language when you want to, when you want to respond. And I would say and I had a lot of sympathy. Actually, it does relate to these questions, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because I think it's an important matter. As a senior member of the SNP and being their spokesperson, I do expect you to get timely replies. I don't expect replies to take so long. I'm sure that the bench has heard, and I would expect a response to be sent rather quickly following your intervention. Right. We're now coming to the statement. I now call the Deputy Prime Minister, Right Honourable Oliver Downey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I will make a statement about malicious cyber activity targeting the United Kingdom by actors that we assess are affiliated to the Chinese state. I want to update the House on our assessment of this activity, and I want to reassure the House on the steps that the Government has taken to shore up our resilience and to hold those actors to account. I know that honourable and right honourable members on both sides of this chamber will recognise the seriousness of this issue, particularly in a year when so many democratic elections will be taking place around the world. Members will be want to be reassured that the Government is taking steps to address the associated threat. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. First, 
the compromise of the United Kingdom Electoral Commission between 2021 and 2022, which was announced last summer. And second, attempted reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts in a separate campaign in 2021. Later today, a number of our international partners, including the United States, will be issuing similar statements to expose this activity and to hold China to account for the ongoing patterns of hostile activity targeting our collective democracies. Mr Speaker, you and parliamentary security have already been briefed on this activity. We want now to be as open as possible with the House and with the British public, because part of our defence is calling out this behaviour. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China, including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. We have seen this in China's continued disregard for universal human rights and international commitments in Xinjiang, China's erasure of dissenting voices and stifling of the opposition under the new national security law in Hong Kong, and the disturbing reports of Chinese intimidation and aggressive behaviour in the South China Sea. It is why this government has investigated and called out so-called Chinese overseas police service stations and instructed the Chinese embassy to close them. However, their cumulative attempts to interfere with the United Kingdom's democracy have not succeeded. Last summer, the Electoral Commission stated that it had been a victim of a complex cyber attack between 2021 and 2022. This was the work of Chinese state-affiliated actors. These actors gained access to the Electoral Commission's email and file sharing systems, which contained copies of the Electoral Register. As the Electoral Commission stated in 2023, when this attack was first made public, the compromise has not affected the security of elections. It will not impact how people register, vote or otherwise participate in democratic processes. I want to reassure people that the compromise of this information, whilst it is obviously concerning, typically does not create a risk to those affected. And I want to further reassure the House that the Commission has worked with security specialists to investigate the incident and remove the threat from their systems. The Commission has since taken further steps to increase the resilience of their systems. In addition, the National Cyber Security Centre assesses it is almost certain that the Chinese affiliated, state affiliated cyber actor known as APT31 attempted to conduct reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts during a separate campaign in 2021. Honourable members may recall that APT31 was one of several cyber actors attributed to the Chinese Ministry of State Security by the United Kingdom and its allies in July 2021. This email campaign by APT31 was blocked by Parliament's cyber security measures. In this case, it was entirely unsuccessful. However, any targeting of members of this House by foreign state actors is completely unacceptable. Taken together, the United Kingdom judges that these actions demonstrate a clear and persistent pattern of behaviour that signal, signals hostile intent from China. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity targeting officials, government entities and parliamentarians around the world. We are today acting to warn 
of the breadth of targeting emanating from Chinese state-affiliated actors like APT31 to sanction those actors who attempt to threaten our democratic institutions and to deter both China and all those who seek to do the same. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last week at the Summit for Democracy in Seoul, I said that we would call out malicious attempts to undermine our democracy yeah, yeah. wherever we find them. This is an important tool in our armoury, and today we are doing just that. The UK does not accept that China's relationship with the United Kingdom is set on a predetermined course, but this depends on the choices that China makes. That is why the Foreign Office will be summoning the Chinese ambassador to account for China's conduct in these incidents. The UK's policy towards China is anchored in our core national interests. Where it is consistent with these interests, we will engage with the Chinese government, but we will not hesitate to take swift and robust actions wherever the Chinese government threatens the United Kingdom's interests. We have done so today and previously. This government will continue to hold China and other state actors accountable for their actions. We will also take serious action to prevent this behaviour from affecting our security. The steps we have taken in recent years have made the UK a harder operating environment for foreign state actors seeking to target our values and our institutions. Through the National Security Act, we now have for the first time a specific offence of foreign interference. This new offence will allow law enforcement to disrupt state-linked efforts to undermine our institutions, rights or political system. Our National Security and Investment Act has overhauled our scrutiny of investment into the United Kingdom by giving the government powers to block, unwind or put conditions on investments that could create national security risks. We have significantly reduced China's involvement in the UK's civil nuclear sector, taking ownership of the CGN's stake in Sizewell Sea nuclear power project and ensuring Chinese state-owned nuclear energy corporations will have no further role in the project. We have put in place measures to prevent hostile infiltration of our universities, including protecting campuses from interference through the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act. The Procurement Act includes national security development provisions that allow us to act where we see malicious influence in our public procurement. I have taken steps to reduce the government's exposure to Chinese operators, banning Hikvision and TikTok from government buildings and devices. And through the National Cyber Security Strategy, we're investing £2.6 billion to increase the cyber resilience of our critical national infrastructure by 2025, making the most important parts of our digital environment a harder target for state and non-state actors. The government is continuing to build the tools, expertise and knowledge to respond to the systemic challenge that China poses to the United Kingdom's security and its values. The integrated review refresh in 2023 took steps towards this, doubling funding for a government-wide programme, including investment in Mandarin language training and deepening diplomatic expertise. But we must also be clear that this is not a problem for the government to solve alone. That is why we created the National Protective Security Authority within MI5 to help businesses and institutions play their part in protecting our security and prosperity. The NPSA will help organisations in the UK's most sensitive fields, including critical national infrastructure operators and world-leading science and tech sectors, to protect themselves against state threats. It is also why I set up the Economic Security Public-Private Forum to ensure that businesses, business leaders in crucial sectors understand the threat to the UK and what they can do to defeat it. And in Parliament, the National Cyber Security Centre has launched an opt-in service for members of both houses. This allows the NCSC to alert high-risk individuals if they identify evidence of malicious activity on their personal devices or account and swiftly advise them on steps to take to protect their information. Today, 
the NCSC has published new guidance for political organisations, including political parties and think tanks, which will help these organisations take effective action to protect their systems and their data. The NCSC is also working with all political parties to increase the uptake of their active cyber defence services in the lead up to a general election. A key component of increasing our resilience is supporting the NCSC and parliamentary authorities by taking up this cyber security offer. And so I urge all members of this House to do so, and I will be writing to colleagues later today, setting out again the steps that they can take to do so. At the Summit for Democracy, I was struck by the powerful strength of our collective voices when we worked together to defend our democratic freedoms. The summit provided the United Kingdom Government with a platform to build international agreement on a new global government compact on countering deceptive use of AI by foreign states in elections. It's important and welcome that our partners across the Five Eyes, as well as those in Europe and the Indo-Pacific, are also standing in solidarity with our efforts to call out malicious cyber activity. I would also like to pay tribute to the dedicated public servants whose painstaking work has continued to expose the reality of the threat we face. Mr Speaker, our political processes and institutions have not been harmed by these attacks. The Government will continue to call out and condemn this kind of activity in the strongest terms. We will continue to work with our allies to ensure that Chinese state-affiliated actors suffer the consequences of their behaviour, and we will take preventative action to ensure these attempts do not succeed. The cyber threat posed by China-affiliated actors is real and it is serious, but it is more than equalled by our determination and resolve to resist it. That is how we defend ourselves and our precious democracy, and I commend this statement to the House. Can I just say it was an important statement. That's why it has run on quite a lot longer than the normal 10 minutes. So in which case, I'm sure everybody agree that if the two front benches need a little extra time, of course, we'll be flexible exactly in the same way. I now come to the Shadow Secretary, Pat McFadden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his statement and for advance sight of it? Uh, it is, of course, a statement about which there has been significant briefing yep. in the press over the past couple of days. Now, on questions of national security, we will support the government in efforts to counter attempts by China or any other state to interfere with or undermine the democratic process, or attempts to stop elected representatives going about their business, voicing their opinions or casting their votes without fear or favour. And with that in mind, can I pay tribute to the efforts made every day by the intelligence and security services to protect the public, to protect our democracy and our way of life. The economic relationship between the United Kingdom and China can never mean compromising on national security or our democratic integrity. Now, the, uh, Deputy Prime Minister's uh, statement touches on a number of issues, and I'd like to ask him some questions about these. Could he say more about the government's assessment of Chinese motives? Uh, does he, for example, believe that Beijing does want to disrupt our democratic process, or instead to gather data about our citizens for some other reason? On the specific issue, of the Electoral Commission and the Electoral Register, why does the Deputy Prime Minister think that the Chinese Government act what is a publicly available database? Does he believe that they were after details of those who may not be on the public register for very good reasons, uh, because, for example, they might be employed in security-sensitive areas? Does he believe they were after details of political donors and their personal uh, data, or for some other uh, motive. Now, he referred to the democratic uh, 
electoral process. And with an election coming, it is, of course, vital that people have confidence in their ability to register and to vote. Uh, can he confirm that the electronic register to vote system that we have is sufficiently well protected? In terms of attacks on parliamentary accounts, the Secretary of State said that the attacks were unsuccessful. But does he believe that China now wants to engage in the kind of hack and leak activity that we have in recent years associated with Russia in order to compromise either individual politicians or the wider democratic process? On the issue of sanctions, only last week the Minister of State was reluctant to respond to the claim that the Foreign Office had indefinitely paused targeted sanctions against Chinese officials late last year. Can the Deputy Prime Minister explain what has changed just in the past week? Uh, now, Mr Speaker, we are very grateful for the work of the Intelligence and Security Committee and the report they issued on China last year, which covered much of the same ground as the Deputy Prime Minister has covered in his statement today. Paragraph 98 of that report, when discussing individual politicians, said the following, and I quote, targets are not limited to serving politicians either. They can include former political figures if they are sufficiently high profile. For example, it is possible that David Cameron's role as Vice President of a £1 billion China-UK investment fund was in some part engineered by the Chinese state to lend credibility to Chinese investment. Close quote. What has the government done to look into this allegation from the Intelligence and Security Committee? How can ministers ensure that those leaving politics are not targeted in the way that the committee discussed? And in that spirit, Mr Speaker, I've read reports that the Conservative Backbench 1922 Committee is to be briefed on these matters later today. Given the importance of national and democratic security to all the parties in this House, is the Deputy Prime Minister intending to arrange a briefing for the Leader of the Opposition, the Intelligence and Security Committee, or indeed the other political parties represented in this House? Experts in this field have warned of China's voracious appetite for data and the potential uses of this as computing power improves, for example, as quantum computing develops. Now, the UK's record on data security is patchy, to put it mildly. What is the government doing to protect complex and valuable data sets from being stolen now possibly in order to be manipulated later by more powerful computers that are controlled by authoritarian adversaries. And finally, Mr Speaker, on the broader issue, does the fact that the Deputy Prime Minister chose to make this statement today signal a fundamental reassessment of the overall threat? He referred to the United States and our allies. On the 12th of February, the United States Administration warned Congress that the cyber threat from China was changing. Previously, a threat that largely involved spying and influencing now looked like it was getting ready to disrupt critical American infrastructure, aviation, energy, healthcare, and other sectors. Is it now the UK's government view that we should change our assessment of the threat in a similar way? If so, this is of the utmost importance and we would need to know what corresponding improvements the government would make to the preparedness of our critical infrastructure. Because if the threat really has changed, then so too should our response. Well, I, I thank the honourable gentleman for his questions. I'll seek to address as many of them as I, I can. When it comes to um, Chinese motivations, Ultimately, uh, it's a matter for the, the, the Chinese to be able to justify their motivations. I think the points he made are both apposite. Uh, first of all, I think that the Chinese look at successful democratic countries like the United Kingdom, or indeed Japan and the Republic of Korea, where I was uh, last week, 
and they want to seek to undermine successful democratic countries. So it's no surprise that they should seek to interfere in electoral processes, just as you have seen conduct from, from Russia that aligns with that. And indeed, uh, the, the successful democratic elections we're having around the world right now stand in contrast with the sham elections that we saw in Russia last yeah. weekend. On the point about uh, the, the, the public uh, record uh, of the Electoral Commission, I think that is the essence of what's happened here. These attacks and these attempts were ultimately pretty unsuccessful. And I would like to, to reassure the uh, Honourable Gentleman and members of this House that there was uh, no infiltration of the, the closed register of the Electoral Commission, so the, the concerns he raised have not uh, arisen. In terms of further strengthening the Electoral Register, that's precisely the work that the National Cyber Security Centre does in coordination with GCHQ, uh, working with uh, government agencies, including the Electoral uh, Commission. He's right to raise the, uh, the, the risk of hack and leak. It's certainly something that we saw in previous elections. I remain concerned about hack and leak. I also remain uh, very concerned about uh, artificial intelligence being used to disrupt elections, particularly in relation to deep fakes, hence the the work that uh, I undertook at, at the conference last week and the progress we're making with this accord in, in relation to uh, artificial intelligence use by uh, malign states. Uh, the, in relation to targeted sanctions, it's not the case that the FCDO paused targeted uh, sanctions. Uh, in relation to the, the conduct of the former uh, or the, the current uh, Foreign Secretary who sits in the, uh, who sits in the other place. Uh, all, all appointments are... Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, sacking the, the Foreign Secretary from the dispatch box. The, um, uh, they, are, they are subject to, to the usual propriety and ethic processes for any appointments to, to government. In relation to the 1922 Committee, uh, the, the Lord Cameron is uh, addressing the 1922 Committee in his capacity as Foreign Secretary in the usual way, addressing a wide range of issues. It's not a specific briefing uh, on this, but if, 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 leader, if, if, if leaders of the principal opposition parties wish to have further briefing on this, uh, of course, I'm very happy to facilitate that in the way that they will know I have done in relation to other national security-related uh, uh, issues. Um, in, in relation to the, the, the risks from hostile states hoovering up currently quantum-encrypted um, uh, information, which could then be, be, be decoded subsequently with advances in quantum computing, we are highly alert to this, uh, and we do extensive work with the National Cyber Security Centre and uh, with the Ministerial Cyber Board on critical national infrastructure to make sure we guard ourselves against exactly uh, that risk. Uh, in terms of our, our relationship with uh, China more broadly, I think members of this House should take this moment very seriously. It is a grave uh, moment, uh, and we will not, and it is in a ba against the backdrop of an escalating threat from China and we will take proportionate action in response to that escalating threat. Yeah, yeah. Sir Ian Duncan-Smith. Mr Speaker, um, tomorrow is three years since uh, the parliamentarians were sanctioned, and your defence, Mr Speaker, of us has been remarkable. But what I will say is that whilst I welcome these two sanctions uh, from the government, it is a little bit, this statement, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. The reality is that in those three years, uh, the Chinese have trashed the Sino-British agreement. They have been committing murder and slave labour and genocide in Xinjiang. We have had churches broken and, in Hong Kong, false uh, uh, court cases against Jimmy Lai. So my question really is to my right honourable friend, why two? America has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none and three lowly officials only in Xinjiang. Surely this means that the integrated review should now be changed. They are not an epoch-defining challenge, strange as that may be, but they are surely a threat, and can they now correct that so that we all know where we are with China? Well, uh, I thank my right friend for his question, and his, his views are very well known to me, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, I genuinely uh, welcome a constructive, at most times, debate that I have with the uh, right on gentlemen. But nobody should be in any doubt 
about the gravity of this matter. They're not the actions of a friendly state, and they do require our serious attentions. This, as has been described by the right hon. Gentleman, is an escalating situation. The measures we've announced today are the first step, but the Government will respond proportionately at all times to, in relation to the facts in front of it. But no one should be in any doubt about the Government's determination to face down and deal with these threats to our national security from wherever they come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kirsty Blackman, SNP spokesperson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his statement and for the advanced sight of it. During the statement, he said, I have taken steps to reduce the government's exposure to Chinese operators, banning Hikvision and TikTok from government buildings and devices. But the reality is that the Hikvision ban only extends to sensitive sites, despite the fact that we have pushed him to try to ensure that it extends to all public buildings, because surely the majority of things that happen in government involve some sort of confidential information. Um, can the Deputy Prime Minister confirm whether he is extending this ban beyond sensitive of sites to all government sites, as we have been calling for for a number of years now. Mr Speaker, these attacks referenced on the Electoral Commission and the parliamentarian accounts happened nearly three years ago. Will we be sitting here in 2027 hearing about an attack that's happening right now? Yes. Um, the EU is currently de delivering €214 million Euros for cybersecurity to improve their collective resilience. Will the government deliver an equivalent fund for these islands? Without more action, Mr Speaker, can the Deputy Prime Minister give us real assurances that the general election that's going to take place this year will take place without international inter interference? Uh, well, well, in respect to the points the Honourable Lady raises, uh, as she is aware, we, we currently ban Hick vision from, and indeed it's not just Hick vision, it's other, any Chinese uh, technology in relation to sense, uh, to, uh, 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 in, in, in relation uh, to CCTV. Uh, we continue to keep that under review. I don't rule out a, a further uh, progression in the policy, but that's, that's not the case right now. In terms of the time taken, and this is an important point, it's really essential that before government ministers stand at this dispatch box and make assertions attributing to a hostile state the, the conduct uh, of, of this kind of activity, we are absolutely sure of the basis on which we do it. So that requires extensive work by our intelligence agencies, it requires fine judgments to be made, and it requires work to be done with our allies around the world, and you will see comments from the United States shortly after my statement. So I would rather we did this in the, the proper way. In relation to our investment, in fact, we have invested £2.6 billion during this spending review, £2.6 billion on uh, cyber security. So I, I can never be totally confident in relation to, to cyber security. No government minister anywhere in the world can be. This is a, an environment in which the risks are escalating all the time. They are being turbocharged by artificial intelligence. But I can assure the Honourable Lady and other members of this House that we are constantly increasing our activity and our vigilance in the face of it. Jim yeah. yeah. Lawton. My right hon. Friend for Chingford, I too am rather underwhelmed by this uh, statement. In the three years since we've been sanctioned, we have been the seven parliamentarians subject to intimidation, impersonation, hacking, as well as the families of exiles from China who we have associated uh, uh, with us. Today, the Minister has described hostile actors, malign acts towards the integrity of our electoral system and parliamentary democracy, foreign interference and sanctioned two individuals and one entity which is a company which employs 50 people with a turnover of £208,000. So does the Minister think that this is proportionate? And specifically, can the Minister confirm that the Government will be putting the whole of the Chinese Communist Government in the enhanced tier of the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme? Well, in, in relation to the enhanced tier of the Foreign uh, Interference Registration Scheme, uh, the Honourable Gentleman may, may be aware that uh, we are currently uh, in the process of collective government agreement in relation to it. Clearly, the, uh, the 
the, act, the conduct I have described today will have a very strong bearing on the decision that, that we make in respect of it. In relation to the sanctions, it is worth noting this is the first time that the government has imposed sanctions in respect of cyber activity. I do believe these are proportionate and targeted, but they also sit, they also sit uh, in the context of actions that we have been taking with our international allies. They are a first step, and uh, as the situation evolves, we remain totally open to taking further steps. It's clear the path we are going on with this. My first reaction, Mr Speaker, is that's it, yeah. Yeah. because uh, the spin clearly didn't match uh, this statement. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister says that uh, there's an issue around nuclear and uh, uh, higher education. Well, the reason for that is, is because the government encouraged China to actually invest in nuclear and cut the budgets of our universities, so they're reliant on Chinese yeah. students. Yeah. Yeah. He also ducked the question asked by uh, my uh, right one from the front bench about Lord Cameron. Yeah. Uh, will he now publish all yeah. the money and interactions he had with the Chinese, Chinese entities when he was out of government? And he actually says he's committed to uh, the um, uh, security services. Can I ask him then why, that in the budget on the 6th of March, the security budget was cut by £600 million pounds yeah. next year? That is not a sign of a government that's taken this issue very yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, the, the Foreign Secretary has provided a full declaration of all of his uh, interests. I, I, I will take with a pinch of salt from the benches opposite lectures on action in relation to security threats. It was this government that introduced the National Security Investment Act in 2021. It was this government that passed the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act in 2023. It's this government that has passed the National Security Act in 2023, none of which we saw from the party opposite during their years in office. Yeah. Right. Mr. Speaker, we've seen reports of espionage on UK campus, aggression on UK soil, massive cyber attacks and uh, hostile corporate takeovers. It's abundantly clear that China is a hostile state and poses an unprecedented threat to our national security. As Home Secretary, I oversaw the enactment of the National Security Act, which built the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme, designed specifically to deal with these threats so that our authorities have the right powers to tackle them. Isn't there a compelling case for China to be listed on that register? Yep. And if not now, then when? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, by the way, I pay tribute to the uh, right honourable uh, lady for the work that she did, and she and I work closely together on many of those uh, things. The, uh, there is a strong case for it. Uh, she, the right honourable lady will be aware of the process that we go through in, in determining that it has to be agreed through a collective government uh, agreement. Now, on this point about the hostile state, though, I do disagree with the bride and lady. It is not the case that any Five Eyes nation has designated China uh, explicitly a hostile state. The language I have used in relation to China reflects the complex situation of, of the state of China, but I want colleagues to be in no doubt about the direction that government policy has taken, how gravely we take this, and the, the overall escalation of our stance on this. Angela Eagle. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. I, I too am quite surprised at the difference between uh, what was briefed and some of the information that the Deputy Prime Minister has given us today and the action and the sum of the action. He said that the government had taken rapid and robust action when he was talking about things that happened three and four years ago, and the sanctioning of two individuals in a minor company doesn't seem to be the definition of robust <coughs> to me. Uh, how uh, does he think that taking such tiny steps will actually deter the Chinese from carrying on in the same way as they have been doing, which has been very clear from the China report that the ISC uh, was finally allowed to publish late, how will uh, these tiny steps that he's announced today actually deter the Chinese from continuing in exactly the same way as he's uh, outlined? Well, well, first of all, in relation to, to briefings, I can assure you, Mr Speaker, and I can assure members of this House that there's been no briefing whatsoever from me or from my department in respect to this. I, I, can, I can categorically 
I can categorically assure you. So, uh, but as ever, I would say, don't believe everything that you read in the newspapers. Now, uh, in, in relation in relation to the uh, in relation to the overall direction of of government policy, uh, it is clearly set. It is not just a case of offensive action, but it is a case of the extensive defensive action we have taken to continuously increase uh, the security of our government systems. Uh, I make no apology for the time we have taken to properly call out to China in respect to this. I want to make sure that when I stand here at the dispatch box, I am able to do so on a solid basis, painstakingly uh, put together by uh, our allies and by our security agencies. Yeah. Who should we go? Former Attorney General, no less. Sir Mike Leather. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The front page of The Telegraph today reports Whitehall sources saying that China, Russia and Iran are even fuelling disinformation about the Princess of Wales to destabilise the nation. Now, hostile states with leaders who fake their own elections and are hated by their own people are spreading wild conspiracy theories about the royal family, amongst many other things, our royal family, which is hugely popular and much loved. Now, would the Deputy Prime Minister agree with me that British people will obviously ignore uh, this grotesque disinformation, despite the pathetic attempts of, um, of, the, of, the, uh, of those autocratic regimes? Well, I, I thank my right honourable friend for raising this issue, and I uh, would like to begin by extending uh, my best wishes to members of the royal family at this very uh, difficult time. Uh, the appalling speculation that we have seen uh, over the past uh, few weeks comes as a reminder to us all that it is important for us to ensure that uh, we deal with valid and trusted information and that we are appropriately sceptical about many online sources. Yeah, yeah. Stuart M. Thank you. thank you, Mr Speaker. As one of the parliamentarians targeted, can I thank the security officials for the work they did to repel this attack? I'm glad it wasn't successful. Uh, but I have to say, uh, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister has turned up at a gunfight with a wooden spoon. The attack that he stood at the dispatch box and announced happened three years ago, but he comes to the House and calls it swift. Yep, exactly. He comes to the House and says he has taken robust action, but as my honourable friend mentioned earlier, the entity he sanctioned has fewer than 50 employees and a turnover of £200,000 a year. He has not sanctioned a single Chinese yep. state official. Yep. Yep. He has not even told the House whether or not the Chinese What's ambassador the has been summoned after what he's come to the no, dispatch box to tell, us, to tell us today. Oh, forgive me, it says he has been summoned. My apologies. But can I, can, I ask the, can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister, or rather press the Deputy Prime Minister, on the enhanced tier for the Foreign uh, <coughs> Influence Registration Scheme, what possible good excuse could there be for not having China in that? And isn't it the case that if we don't take more robust action and see a proper sea change in government thinking, rather than this tinkering around the edges, this will happen more and more and get worse and worse. Here, here. Well, I think everything about the Honourable Gentleman's question suggests that he didn't actually listen to the statement I made. I, I said that there had been a démarche, and that, uh, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, I've already set out the, the position in relation to the, the foreign uh, registration system. Greg Clark. Indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister knows that cyber attacks on UK institutions come from a wide range uh, of actors, states and criminals, as we saw in the recent big attack on the British Library. It's important that our laws are up to date to protect against this. Now, in, 90, in 2022, the Government announced that it would update the Network and Information Systems Regulations 2018 to, and I quote, protect essential and digital services against increasingly sophisticated and frequent cyber attacks, both now and in the future. In 2022, it was to be done as soon as parliamentary time allowed. Why has it not been done, and when will it be? Uh, uh, well, the, the work is pretty much complete, and as soon as parliamentary time allows, we'll be bringing forward those, those measures. Sir Christopher Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm sorry. I found the Deputy Prime Minister today utterly unconvincing. Um, the, the idea that swift means taking three years 
to, to publish something which has already been published by a committee of this House is utterly preposterous. It means that if there were an attempt this year, we would hear about it long after the general election and possibly after another general election after that. The truth is, if he actually thinks that this is the sum total of all the Chinese state's attempts on, to disrupt the British democratic system, he's willfully blind and is therefore dangerous. There are two things, you know, that the, that the government could do immediately to enhance confidence in this area. First of all, is, make, is bring forward the motion to allow the Foreign Secretary to answer questions in this House from members of the House of Commons, and secondly, publish the full, unexpurgated Russia report. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm sorry that you're not happy with the right honourable gentleman sitting to my, my right hand side. I think he does an excellent job of answering, uh, answering questions uh, to, uh, to this House. Uh, in, in relation to the, the, the time that it is taken, there is a difference between uh, acknowledging, uh, as the Electoral Commission did, the fact that the attack had taken place, and the process of attribution, which takes a longer period of time for the reasons I have set out repeatedly from this dispatch box. Sir Alex Shelburne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to have the British Library in my constituency at Boston Spa and I, Thorpe Arch, and I um, will be meeting with them in um, a, a week's time um, to talk about the cyber attack. And that is just one aspect which has happened very recently. But we are talking about the protection of democracy as well, and it does concern me at the time frames in which we are moving on some issues. Um, one of the big concerns is going to be deep fake news profiles, people alleged to have been saying things, videos of yeah. people alleged to be doing things at the next election. And I urge my um, right honourable friend to work now to try and establish procedures that everybody across this House on all sides will be able to call out efficiently fake news that may be used to try and influence the election because, as my honourable friend said, you've got to be careful what you believe, but what can people believe in unless there are robust systems to call out what is absolutely fake? Oh. <clears throat> well, my honourable friend is absolutely right to uh, raise this issue. We are doing a work with tech companies in relation to, for example, watermarking of, uh, of images to make sure that people have a sense of whether they're real or not. It can't just, though, be uh, action from the UK government. We have to work internationally, which is why uh, at the Global Summit for, for Democracy we launched this uh, Global Government Compact on countering deceptive use of AI by foreign states in elections. That's the United Kingdom uh, leading across nations around the world to make sure we can act in coordination to address it. Moreover, it is also the case that everyone in this uh, rapidly evolving technological world needs to be mindful of information that they see. I mean, it cannot be trusted in the way it might have been able to be trusted just a few years ago. Richard Ford. Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister has talked in his statement this afternoon about the powerful strength of our collective voices. If we contrast the sanctions that have been announced this afternoon with uh, those that followed the Novichok poisoning in 2018, yeah. On that occasion, 130 Russian diplomats yeah. were expelled from yeah. over 25 countries and the exactly. EU ambassador to Moscow was withdrawn. What steps is the government taking to seek to coordinate a robust response to this alleged attack on democracy by working with our democratic allies? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that is exactly what we are doing. I, I raised it with uh, opposite numbers in both Japan and Korea when I was there. I uh, raised it with the United States. The United States will uh, with whom we have been coordinating exceptionally closely, will be uh, shortly, if not uh, currently, uh, making a statement in relation to their actions. This is precisely why we have proceeded in this way, to make sure that we do not just act alone. We act with like-minded states. I would say not just it was interesting, it's not just in relation to Five Eyes, it's relation, in relation to European partners uh, and uh, international partners, particularly in the Asia-Pacific. It requires this kind of coordinated action, and this is at a time when when uh, our democratic institutions, uh, not just here but around the world, are under increased threat. So it's important that those democratic nations work together in concert, and that's exactly what we're doing. Mark Pritchard. Can I join the Deputy Prime Minister in paying tribute to all those that do so much in the UK intelligence community? <coughs> Would you join me in reassuring the uh, shadow uh, front bench that the Lord Cameron in another place actually 
uh, oversees GCHQ right now and SIS and is probably in a good place to know what's uh, going on. Um, there's, been reference, there's been reference to the China report published. I was one of the co-authors of one or two others in this uh, chamber in July 2023. And in that report on page 198, it talked about the UK security services facing, quote, a formidable challenge, end quote. Can I welcome the fact that the government has played catch up? That was another criticism that the government uh, was playing catch up. It has, played, uh, it has caught up to a certain extent and particularly welcome over the last three years, £2.6 billion going to cyber protection for our critical national infrastructure. Because we, the furnace to the Deputy Prime Minister did want to finish early because of other things that are happening around the world. If he's happy to continue, I'm happy to keep. In which case, let's carry on. Come on forward. Yeah. Forgive me. I, I think my. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I will regret saying that, Mr. Speaker. But um, the. Uh, I think the. Uh, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right to pay tribute to our intelligence agencies, and I see it firsthand, day in, day out. We are one of a very small number of countries around the world that actually uh, have intelligence agencies of this standard. It enables us all to be more secure. Mr. Ben Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the uh, tone of, uh, of, of, of vigilance. Uh, a stark contrast to the nonchalance shown by the Johnson government over Russian interference earlier in our elections and the Brexit uh, referendum. But why should we believe the government's honest intentions when they still haven't implemented all the recommendations of the Russia report? Uh, well, I, I think the uh, right honourable gentleman would have seen from the conduct of the government, for example, just uh, a few months ago, the further sanctions that we imposed on Russia. We have not hesitated in taking robust action in relation to Russia, just as we will continue to do in relation to any threats from China. Richard Drax. Speaker, bearing in mind all that my right honourable friend has said, he may be concerned to hear what we have heard in the Defence Committee, and that is that English MOD uh, companies are having a a nightmare to employ those with AI speciality skills from university because they're all Chinese. Is my right hand friend aware of this and what's he going to do to counter this potential threat to our security? Well, well clearly anyone uh, employed by a, a relevant defence company or in a uh, UK government will be subject to uh, advanced vetting that, that would, would likely preclude uh, a, a number of the individuals that he's uh, described. The main thing we've got to do is increase our skills in this country, which is why we're investing in science, technology, uh, engineering and maths. I would say, though, we are very, very fortunate. And when, wherever I go in the world, people look with envy on the fact that we have three or four of the top ten universities in the world yeah. in the United Kingdom. That is a base upon which both our intelligence agencies and industry can draw. Thank you. Mr Speaker, we really must ask the question that these are cyber attacks that occurred in 2021 and 2022. How has it taken the government so long to come with this statement today? And when we reflect on what the Deputy Prime Minister said, and I quote, these actors gained access to the Electoral Commission's email and file sharing system, which contain copies of the Electoral Register. Mr Speaker, this is an election year. It should put fear into the hearts of all of us that the Chinese, at a time like this, have got access to the UK <laughs> Electoral Register, when we're already worried about bad actors, about cyber attacks taking place, about the use of AI. And when the, government, the Deputy Prime Minister talks about taking robust action, good grief, two individuals being sanctioned. Reference has been made to what happened after Novichok, and we swiftly took action to expel diplomats from this country and around the world. I hope that when the Chinese ambassador meets with the Deputy Prime Minister, he will be told that diplomats will be getting expelled. And will the Deputy Prime Minister come back to this House tomorrow and tell us about the robust action that he should be taking? Ah. You shout him with robustness. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think I will answer my question in a slightly less ag aggressive way than the, the, the question was put. Uh, but I will I'll make my point in my own way. First of all, in relation to the Electoral Commission, uh, as the Electoral Commission said in its statement, uh, the data contained in the Electoral Register is limited and much of it is already in the, the, the public domain. The Electoral Commission had already declared the fact of the uh, attack. What is different today is we are 
Contrary, indeed, to some of the speculation at the time, we are, um, we, we are uh, announcing that it was in relation to uh, Chinese-related uh, uh, actors. That's, that's what's changed. In relation to our, our overall uh, approach, I've set out a direction. These are grave threats that we take seriously. We are taking proportionate action now, and we will continue to take steps as required. Sir Desmond Swain. A successful deterrent requires, first, the capability, and second, the will to retaliate. Have we got either? Uh, yes, we do on uh, both fronts, and uh, he, he will be, uh, the Honourable Gentleman will be well aware, my Honourable Friend will be well aware of our Cyber Defence Force, but I do not comment on the conduct of that from the dispatch box. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In January 2023, Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton, uh, prior to his appointment as Foreign Secretary, of course, went to Sri Lanka in order to drum up investment for Port City Colombo, a Belt and Road project that was launched by President Xi and which many believe will become a military base for the Chinese Navy. Following his appointment as Foreign Secretary, many uh, FOI requests have been submitted to the FCDO in order to try and shed some light on Lord Cameron's uh, visit to Sri Lanka. Who did he meet? What kind of conversations took place? To date, not a single one of those FOI requests has been complied with by the FCDO. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with me that this is a matter of the highest public interest, yep. that sunlight is the best form of disinfectant, yeah. and therefore that the FCDO should comply with those FOI requests as a matter of urgency? Yeah. 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 Well, the, um, the Foreign uh, and Commonwealth Office uh, always deals with uh, uh, FOI requests in the proper way. I have to say that this is... This is pretty desperate stuff, trying to link uh, Chinese cyber attacks to our, our current Foreign Secretary. It just doesn't wash. It's absolutely right that we call out these malicious actions, otherwise they will become normalised. Would the Deputy Prime Minister agree that when it comes to our security, indeed our economic interests as well, there's a, a, an, an important parity between the digital space and indeed our traditional physical terrain, and that should be reflected in defence spending. Would you also agree that the Beijing is no doubt watching today's events and will doubt, no doubt retaliate? Should we brace ourselves for further individual sanctions against British personnel? Uh, well, the, my, uh, my right hand friend is, is, is absolutely right. First of all, to highlight the need for investment in this, that's precisely why in the last spending review period we put in 2.6 billion pounds in relation to our wider cyber defences. What I would say is in respect of uh, any retaliatory action uh, by Beijing, I am absolutely confident that uh, we will be able to deal with those very effectively. Alison Thewlis. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's, not, it's in various areas of government that we should be worried about Chinese influence. Graham Barrow, the company's house expert, has been warning, warning for quite some time about dubious company and corporations which have originated in China. He believes that they are being created using an algorithm and there's evidence that companies are being incorporated using stolen UK credentials streets at a time. So can I ask uh, the, the Minister, what conversations has he had with Companies House and would he be willing to meet with Graham Barrow to hear his conclusions on this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I or another minister would be very happy to uh, meet with him. That, that's precisely why we set up the National Cyber Security Centre. The National Cyber Security Centre takes GCHQ uh, expertise, uh, which informs our approach to, to cyber and allows uh, the NCSC to engage with businesses and with individuals. And again, around the world, this is a, a, a renowned and admired approach, the fact that we can give this high-quality advice through the National Cyber Security Centre. And week after week, I get delegations coming in from around the world to see what we've done with the National Cyber Security Centre. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The £2.6 billion pounds in additional money to counter cyber threats is very welcome. But, of course, this field is one that is constantly evolving and those that wish us harm innovating further. So, whilst I accept my right hon. Friend won't comment on the exact detail, can he at least assure the House that that £2.6 billion outguns what those who wish us harm are spending on new threats? Uh, well, I think the amount of spending that, that we have compares extremely favourably uh, with similar countries uh, around the world, G7 uh, countries. I'm confident that we have world-leading expertise and that we are constantly evolving our capabilities in this space. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the 
Deputy Prime Minister for his statement and also for his answers. The, the, I, I had the occasion uh, uh, just over a month or five weeks ago to go and see Mr Speaker in relation to, to an incident that took place, uh, and I want to quote it as well. The Minister may be aware, and if not, he will be aware shortly, that the uh, APPG for Freedom of Religious Belief that I chair uh, uh, for had their website hacked as well, uh, and the text which questioned human rights violations by China, and it was removed. I reported that to, to Mr Speaker and made him aware of, of what took place. It is clear that nothing whatsoever is sacred to them, and the work of this House by the elected members of this House is not treated with respect. So will the Deputy Prime Minister commit to stop handling the Chinese uh, oversteps, for want of a better description, with kids' gloves and instead with authority, and help them to understand very clearly that they will not trample over democracy in this place or others without being held accountable? To the very strictest terms. Yes, we will certainly hold them to account in the way that the uh, honourable gentleman describes. And in relation to the uh, attack he describes, I will very happily make sure both parliamentary authorities and the National Cyber Security Centre are in touch with him about it. So, Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Deputy Speaker, we do know that the legacy systems, uh, IT systems, are the most likely to be attacked in cyber. Uh, has the Deputy Prime Minister, would he, and has he? ordered an inventory to be taken of all government IT equipment to see where particularly vulnerabilities lie? Yes, is the answer. and I think uh, my hon. Friend is absolutely right to raise this issue. The first step is to properly understand where those uh, vulnerabilities lie. We have undertaken extensive work to ensure we know where risks lie, and we are putting in place measures to remediate those risks. Chris Law. Speaker, this is too little and too late. It is reactive, not proactive. Two lowly officials get sanctioned when half the UK population's data and electoral roll gets uh, cyber attacked. Just to give you a quick quote to remind you how serious this is, and I don't feel it's been taken seriously enough, just in October last year, MI5 warned, and I quote, of epic scale of Chinese espionage, reporting more than 20,000 people in the UK having been convertly approached online by Chinese spies. And our own Commons Intelligence and Security Committee said China was, and I quote, prolifically and aggressively targeted in the UK and had managed to successfully penetrate every sector of the UK's economy. So my question is very simple. How can any one of us and anyone outside of here, and including entire society, trust the UK government when it's far too late and it does very little about what needs to be done? Uh, I, I simply don't accept that characterisation. When it was this government that set up the National Cyber Security Centre. This is it's this government that set up the ministerial cyber board. It's this government that's invested £2.6 billion into our cyber defences. And I have consistently warned about the cyber threats facing the United Kingdom uh, time after time again, and we are taking steps to address those. Bob Seeley. Deputy Speaker, every time the Deputy Prime Minister comes here, and he's been very eloquent in, in the plans that he lays out, he's more assertive, and we're doing this bit new and that bit new as we react to the threat. Isn't there an issue, though, that we still need to have a much greater sense of coherence across all government departments about how we deal with this threat, whether it's students, whether it's protection of Hong Kong citizens, whether it's intellectual property, or whether it's cyber attacks? Uh, well, I think um, my uh, honourable friend raised an important point, and I pay tribute to the work that he's done in this space, and I've, I've discussed it with him on many occasions. He is right that the, the UK government, in common with US government and others around the world, has evolved enormously in its approach to China. The sort of China that we had hoped for even a decade ago is not the China we have now, whether it's in relation to Hong Kong, whether it's in relation to Xinjiang or elsewhere. Uh, we are continuing to increase our efforts, and in the area that uh, the Honourable Gentleman describes, that's precisely why we set up the Defending Democracy Task Force, which is being led by my right honourable friend, the Security Minister. And Oswald. Deputy Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister is right to address these issues and, as he said, to call it out. But I, I don't think calling it out really cuts the mustard here. There's certainly no appearance of urgency. And th there's a worrying sense of nothing to see here in some of his responses. 
He did reference human rights. We, we know well the issues there, including the horrific forced labour and worse that the Uyghur population face. Then the action that he is outlining on all of these fronts is very underwhelming and actually a bit baffling in that regard. So I wonder, does the Deputy Prime Minister think that the large number of members all across this House today, who are obviously very much underwhelmed by his statement, are all wrong? Or does he think it's possible that the content of his statement is somehow missing the mark? Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, I think it's very important to, to remember that ultimately, and I want to reassure the House and the public, that these attempts were unsuccessful. I'm not being complacent. I'm setting out the facts in terms of the risk whether it was at Cyber UK in Belfast last year, when I warned that cyber threats continue to come from the usual suspects, Russia, China, Iran or North Korea, whether it's in relation to government security conference where I called out Russian state interference, whether it's in relation to creating secure by design, we have not hesitated to take action and we will continue to take action. Speaker, democracy is not perfect, but the right to choose the people who make the laws that govern us is a really precious right, and it is really scary to hear that a foreign power might be trying to intervene on this. Mr Deputy Speaker, as one of the few women who have spoken in this statement, I want to remind you again how concerned I am about the threats and harassment that women get when standing for Parliament, especially as we get closer to election. As well as cyber security, I am very concerned about physical security. Two and a half years ago, my Essex neighbour was murdered at his constituency surgery. Last Friday, at my constituency surgery, the security operatives recommended by this Parliament failed to show up for the second time this year. So I am very grateful to the Deputy Prime Minister for recently putting extra money into security for both parliamentarians and candidates. But can you look again at the workings of this House and how our security is governed? Because that funding is not getting to those of us on the front line. Well, I, uh, I think my right and friend raises a concerning uh, allegation which I will take up from the government side working with House authorities. Uh, as, as she will be aware, uh, we do take this threat exceptionally seriously, which is why we agreed an unprecedented increase in protective security for members of this House and other elected representatives. This is something we should all take very seriously, not least in the light of the two appalling uh, murders of parliamentarians that I've seen in my time in this House. Yeah. Jim Barron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. When it comes to matters of national security like this, my temptation clearly is surely to work cross-party and to have a unified face on this. <laughs> All the same, doesn't the Deputy Prime Minister understand that the relative weakness of the response to this terrible attack, series of attacks, when combined then with his evasiveness over questions around the financial interests of the Foreign Secretary, are bound to increase people's concerns. It is understood that Lord Cameron still has close links to the Chinese state with numerous business ventures, and we also know, for example, that it was reported last week that the government has secretly softened its policy against Chinese uh, businesses implicated in human rights abuses. So will he strengthen his response and demonstrate by his actions and by transparency that this soft pod peddling is nothing suspicious? <coughs> well, the, the Honourable Gentleman stands up and says we should have a cross-party approach that immediately <laughs> uh, uh, seeks on political grounds to denigrate the Foreign Secretary and turn this into a party political matter. Yeah. I'm afraid he has to choose to one approach or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when we think ahead to the election, one of the points that's been raised today is about artificial intelligence and the threat to democracy. We often talk about the concept of deep fake news. It used to be fake news, uh, but it's not just about deep fakes. It's the risk of rumour bombs happening to get people to not go to the polls on the day. It's about voice clones where people may be phoned up to be told that they're uh, pretending to be their daughter or their family member saying, don't go and vote today. There are many risks that we may not even be aware of. And the data that we're talking about today may be used in conjunction with data from Facebook and from other places to um, pretend that they are something that they are not. So can I ask, along with the work that's going on uh, within government and with tech companies, can we also look at an education campaign to let the public know that there are better ways to be aware of the risks that they may uh, be under uh, during the election? Thank you. Uh, 
I, I think my honourable friend makes a really important point because there will always be limitations at a time with rapidly evolving technology, particularly artificial intelligence, for the ability of agencies or the companies themselves to be able to call this stuff out. There needs to be greater awareness from the public about the risks and the fact that they should treat these kind of images with a much higher degree of scepticism than they did previously. And it's something I will be taking up with my colleague, the Education Secretary. Carol Moynihan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Professor Jim Saker, who is the President of the Institute of Motor Industry, has warned about the threat that Chinese manufactured electric vehicles could pose, um, giving access to big data and personal, de um, and personal information. Um, he has gone on to say that Chinese connected EVs flooding the country could be the most effective Trojan horse that the Chinese establishment has to impact the UK. Can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister what consideration he has given to the threat posed by Chinese manufactured EVs? Here, here, here. Well, I think the Honourable Lady raises a, a very important point. Clearly, uh, any new technology or cars put on the UK market will have to meet with our uh, safety standards, and it will include an assessment of those sort of threats. So what I would say is that we also work in conjunction with the uh, National Security and Investment Act under which I can make uh, decisions to block or impose conditions on uh, any investments or transactions uh, from whichever state they, they, they come from, companies in whichever country they come from. So again, that's another tool in our weaponry which we didn't have previously. Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend will no doubt be aware that the Electoral Commission failed an NCSC Cyber Essentials audit around the time that these breaches uh, occurred. Among the failings identified were staff laptops and smartphones running outdated systems, and including Windows 10 Enterprise, which at the relevant time was no longer receiving security updates. Does my right honourable friend not agree that these failings look awfully like extraordinary negligence on the part of the Electoral Commission? And how satisfied is he that they have done everything necessary to regularise their procedures? Well, I, I think the right on gentleman is, is right to, to highlight that, and it's precisely because of those concerns that we've ensured the Electoral Commission is working very closely with the National Cyber Security Centre to achieve a significant step up uh, in their, their capabilities uh, and their cyber resilience. Uh, it was essential that that work was undertaken, and it has been undertaken. Alexander Stafford. Much indeed, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In May this year, we have local elections in Rotherham, like other places across uh, the country. Now, the last local election in 2021, Labour kept control of Rotherham Council by only 54 electors. So, what steps is the government putting in place to make sure when people go and cast their votes in May for the Conservatives in Rotherham, those votes are secure to end 50 years of Labour rule? Well, I. I trust and hope that they will uh, achieve that uh, outcome. I would like to uh, assure members that we have every confidence in the integrity of those uh, elections and through the Defending Democracy Task Force, through my uh, colleague, the, the, the Minister for Local Government, who has written out to all local authorities in the past week, we are ensuring that the integrity of those important elections is preserved. I'd like to thank the uh, Deputy Prime Minister for his statement today and for responding to questions for over an hour. We are now moving on to the next statement on Women's State Pension Age Report. Mel Stride. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I would like to make a statement to provide an interim update on the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman's investigation in the way changes to the state pension age were communicated to women born in the 1950s. I am grateful to the Ombudsman for conducting this investigation. I recognise the strength of feeling there is on this issue, and it is important to set out the wider context and our initial understanding of the report itself. The fact it has taken over five years for the Ombudsman to produce the final report reflects the complexity of this matter. The period the investigation considers spans around 30 years, dating back to the decision Parliament took in 1995 to equalise the state pension age for men and women gradually from 2010. Since then, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
Changes have been made through a series of Acts of Parliament by successive governments, which resulted in the state pension age rising to 65 for women by November 2018 and then to 66 by October 2020. The announcement in 1993 to equalise the state pension age addressed a long-standing inequality between men and women. These changes were about maintaining the right balance between the sustainability of the state pension, fairness between generations and ensuring a dignified retirement in later life. Women retiring today, Mr Deputy Speaker, can still expect to receive the state pension for over 21 years on average, over two years longer than for men. Had the Government not equalised the state pension age, women would have been retiring today at 60, and they could have spent, on average, over 40% of their adult lives in receipt of state pension. This would have been unfair, as by the 1990s, life expectancy had significantly increased compared to 1948, when state pension age for women was set at 60. In turning to the investigation itself, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it is important to be clear about what the Ombudsman has not said, particularly following some of the inaccurate and misleading commentary since the report was published. The Ombudsman has not looked at the decision to equalise the state pension age, but rather at how that decision was communicated by DWP. The report hinges on the Department's decisions over a narrow period between 2005 and 2007 and the effect of those decisions on individual notifications. The Ombudsman has not found that women have directly lost out financially as a result of DWP's actions, with the report stating, and I quote, we do not find that it, meaning DWP's communication, resulted in them referring to the complainants suffering direct financial loss. And the final report has not said that all women born in the 1950s will have been adversely impacted, as many women were aware their state pension age had changed. Mr Deputy Speaker, in his Stage 1 report, what the Ombudsman did find was that, and I quote, between 1995 and 2004, DWP's communication of changes to state pension age reflected the standards they would expect it to meet. That report also confirms that accurate information about changes to the state pension age was publicly available in leaflets through DWP's pension education campaigns, through DWP's agencies and on its website. However, when considering the DWP's actions between August 2005 and December 2007, the Ombudsman came to the view that those actions resulted in 1950s-born women receiving individual notice later than they might had different decisions been made. Mr Deputy Speaker, during the course of the Ombudsman's investigation, it is important to remember that the state pension age changes were considered by the courts. In 2019 and 2020, the High Court and the Court of Appeal respectively found no fault with the actions of DWP. The courts made clear that under successive governments dating back to 1995, the action taken was entirely lawful and did not discriminate on any grounds. During these proceedings, the Court of Appeal held that the High Court was entitled to conclude as a fact that there has been, and I quote, adequate and reasonable notification given by the publicity campaigns implemented by the Department over a number of years. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Ombudsman has taken five years to produce his final report. As the Chief Executive of the Ombudsman herself has set out, DWP has fully cooperated with the Ombudsman's investigation throughout this time and provided thousands of